like this is the size of a Bitcoin transaction today. If you do confidential transactions and you make the amounts private, then it suddenly it's huge, right? But with bulletproofs, it brings it way down, and it's like not as small as original, but it's much much better. Yes, this is more efficient. Wallet wasabi coming soon. What's up? What's up? My big e people. Um, today we're joined by Adam Gibson. Um, our first episode, and thank you for joining us. No problem. Uh, let's get right into it. So, okay. with the Cyberpunk channel, our big D people, we're basically talking in Bitcoin movie language. Make it more easier for people to understand. So, let's start off with our questions for you, Adam. Tell us. A bit about yourself um, before you got involved in Bitcoin. Sure. Okay. Um, my background is well, you could say maths and physics. That's that's always been something that interested me from an early age. Um, I got involved in software engineering in the late '90s as well. Um, I've done various jobs. Uh, mathematics teacher was probably my biggest job before I got involved in Bitcoin. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Math yeah. So, sure. sure. And I, I did work a little bit in um, kind of finance industry and in the kind of back end computer software engineering part of finance. So I had a certain amount of background in finance as well. But yeah. And the programming aspects? Kind of yeah, sort of the back end of a, something called a, a clearinghouse, which is where think of it as a bank for banks, you know, because okay. banks have to do transactions between each other. You know. Okay. Yeah. So how did you get involved in Bitcoin? Well, um, it was it, it was a while after it started, uh, probably end of 2012, or, or let's say during 2012. I, I couldn't tell you exactly when I first heard about it, but I heard about it a couple of times on the internet and read about it, and it seemed yeah, it seemed like a bit of an impractical idea. <laughs> probably nobody would use it, you know. Right. Like a lot of people, a lot of people back then probably looked at it like me and thought oh, that doesn't really seem to do anything. But then, like towards the end of 2012, and and the price was going up, and I thought, well, people seem to be paying attention to this, you know. So, at some point, I I, I was interested enough to actually uh, look into it technically, you know. And that basically means at that time it meant reading the white paper, which wasn't easy, even for somebody with my background. This is something to sort of reflect on. Even somebody with my technical back background looking at that, there was a whole host of ideas in there that were really quite unfamiliar to me. So I had to do a lot of side reading, even to get to the point where I, you know, somebody with my background could understand it. So I have, I have every sympathy for people who don't have like computing or, or math background to actually understand it. It's like, understand it. how do you, do you mentioned white paper and people are like, white paper is that like a blank sheet of paper? What is that? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, a white paper is 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 the idea of a just writing a paper, but not in a formal academic context. Like, if you're going to make a proposal for a new system in something like cryptography or, or, or computer science, you're supposed to get, you know, peer review. You know, the idea is it gets published by some prestigious journal after several prestigious scientists have read it and checked it and da-da-da-da-da, right? So with the, the idea, at least in this context, as far as I understand it, a white paper here is just, look, I'm just writing this, send it out to the world, and let's just see what happens, you know? Okay. Of course, it's all, it's all become very skewed nowadays because, you know, ICOs, ICOs. If you read these white papers nowadays, they're like, here's our business plan. You know, here's how we're going to make all this money. I mean, Satoshi did not write that kind of white paper. Well, so the ICOs are more business-oriented, whereas the yeah. white papers you're talking about are more technical, more involved. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so what past projects have you worked on and how did you, how did this lead you specifically to privacy in Bitcoin? Okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, well, when I first got involved in Bitcoin, apart from just like buying some and fi figuring out how to buy some was hard enough. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, that was hard and it's still hard <laughs> in some ways. And as well as that, obviously, I was playing around with it, playing around with the software. You know, that was interesting. It was really interesting. But uh, what I spent most of my sort of early time in Bitcoin interested in was um, something called TLS Notary. And it's kind of like peripherally, yeah, TLS Notary. Okay. Yeah, and it's kind of a peripherally related idea, only, only peripherally, because it was about uh, the idea that you wanted to like verify uh, online uh, bank statements or, or other online documents. Okay. Um, we could do a whole like talk about this. It's, it's another <laughs> yeah. technology. 
But the, the connection to some extent is cryptography because it really fascinated me trying to figure out how you could like play around with these cryptographic protocols, especially in how you could change the kind of trust model. You know, like trust model. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, when I pay you something, there's trust involved, right? Right. Basically, yes. inev inevitably. But with cryptography, you can kind of play with that and change the dynamics of it. In what sense? In what sense? All right. So the idea with TLS Notary was specifically this: that if you tell me that you've made um, a bank wire, you've paid me, uh, and then I'm going to give you bitcoins in in response, we have this kind of uh, inter intermediary period where there's a problem, because if you tell me you've paid uh, my bank account, I, I don't know that you have until maybe some days later, right? Yes, exactly. And, and, there's a little bit of delay in the processing. Right, there's a delay, right? But if I can somehow prove to you, if I can somehow prove to you that there's an actual signature from the bank yes. saying that I've made that payment, it might change that trust dynamic, right? Okay, yeah. So the idea, the idea there is uh, of signature is absolutely central. Okay, because we're used to the idea of a signature being here's a piece of paper, I write yeah. blah blah blah, and I put my name on it. Obviously, that's not very strong, is it? As as a yeah, kind of it's protocol, your, it's your personal signature, but people can um, that's the word forge. Yeah, forge it, and um, that's a problem that we're trying to get yeah. over. Exactly. So, yeah. Okay, with Bitcoin, it. The signature concept. Uh, there's a, yeah, but there's something. There's, it, it is complicated, but there's something about it that I think even before you get into the the mathematics, there's something about it people don't even think about, which is this: like everyone knows, obviously you can forge a signature. But yes. did you ever think about the fact that when you write the signature at the bottom of a document, how does that tie into the rest of the document? Because you know you've probably seen like in comedy movies or, or just some, some read it in a book where somebody's like signed a document, but they haven't actually signed the real document. They signed something else accidentally, or somebody's tricked them, right? Right. Yes. So, so, so what we what we get with cryptography is a much much better idea, which is that the signature covers the entirety of the message in the mathematics. So even if I were to change one letter of the thing, you know, if I signed a document, say, I owe Deja a hundred dollars. Um, somebody else could could like fiddle around with the document and make it a thousand dollars, right? And oh, yeah. but we, zero there. right, right, right. And and then my my signature at the bottom, it doesn't matter, right? It's it's not really doing the job that we we pretend that it's doing. We we pretend that it's giving trust in its scenario. It really doesn't give it. But in in these mathematical constructs that we now call digital signatures, we get the proper effect, where if you change that zero, added that zero, the whole signature the would whole not be valid. Would Okay. Um, right, right, right. And that's that's at the heart of Bitcoin. And I, I mentioned TLS Notary, the connection there is just that, again, it was it was really about a similar thing where could you make a signature that was actually from the bank that would be valid in that sense, completely valid, yeah. Okay, I understand. Um, I read a little on the join market. Sure. On No Power 73's blog. And mm -hmm. I was still confused. Because there are a lot of technical terms, so can you, yeah. you know, give me the basics of what is joint market? Not only am I able to pay two people, but even better, me and another person can both be the payers, and then there could be two people being paid, all in one transaction, all or nothing. Wow. Right. So I, I, call, I like to use the phrase many-to-many -many mapping. So think of it in your head as being lots of things coming in and lots of things going out. Right. Now, it just so happens that usually it's one person paying one other person because that's just like normal, right? I mean, well, that's, yeah, how... That's, every day, that's how we do Yeah, that's how we do things, right? Yeah. But that doesn't mean we can't do other things, right? No. And one, one other thing we can do once we once we understand this many to mapping, many to many yeah, mapping okay. idea, uh -huh. uh, one cool thing we can do is we can have like parallelized transactions. Like you're paying for a coffee in 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 the coffee shop, but your friend is also paying. Well, I, I could say the same coffee shop, or maybe your friend is paying is paying for their dry cleaning, right? So two payments could be merged together. Mm. We both make the payments in in this all all together, uh, many to many mapping. Now, what's the point of that? You're asking. That's pointless. Why would you two people want to lock their payments together? Because, and the answer is, yeah. the answer is privacy, right? The answer is because it makes it more confusing to a person reading the payment. You see, yeah, because now they don't know if you paid the dry cleaner and your friend paid for the coffee or vice versa. Okay, they can't um, mm. Mm. know which address is yours. 
right in oh, right the, now here's where it gets difficult that what i just described to you is actually wrong it doesn't work here's what here's why because um your coffee costs let's say three dollars and your your friend's dry cleaning costs let's say twenty thirty dollars no. they cost different amounts right mm -hmm. so when you make your payment you're paying three dollars the input that you give is only three dollars yeah and your your friend's your friend's payment is is I don't know, fifty dollars, right? It's a, a totally different number. So actually, what I just told you isn't true because when a person looks at the transaction, they can see, oh, there's a three going in and there's a three going out. So that must have been a direct payment. Cool. Yeah, you see what I mean? It's like we've made the two transactions parallel, but they're still obviously distinct transactions because they've got different amounts. Yeah, you could sell the amount. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so in that case, the, the parallelizing it and making it, as I said, atomic or many, to, uh, well, atomic, all in one, it was pointless. So the trick is you just make the amounts equal. Okay. So we, what we do in join market as an implementation of the idea of coin join is to have lots of people make payments where the output amounts are all equal. Similar, okay. Well, not just similar, they have to be they exactly to be equal. equal. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is obviously a restriction, but it has this privacy effect because if you and your friend were both paying for a coffee and the coffee was exactly the same amount, $3, it's fundamentally impossible for me to know which of the outputs is from you and which of the outputs is from your friend. Okay. Yeah. You see the idea? Basically what John market is. Yeah, yeah, and join market is uh, is just is 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 one way of doing what we call coin join. What I've just described to you is coin join, mm -hmm. and the only to keep it really simple, the only extra thing about join market is the idea of a market. So what I just described to you is not very practical. People don't want to like find random people all around the world and do equal sized payments with them. It's just like weird. It's like time, it sounds time consuming. Uh, it's very yeah. It's a whole load of stuff, right? Yeah. So here's the trick: is make a market where some people wait to do that, wait to help you do that, and they get paid a little bit of money every time you do it. Okay, so, so yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, you get the idea. Yes, yes. Um, uh, what do you think about bullet proofs? Just heard about this. So. Right, this is a, a new hot topic. So, so bulletproofs is a is a um, maybe maybe we should just talk about one other thing before that, which is pretty easy to explain, I think. Uh, which is something called confidential transactions. Uh, it's a simple name. Confidential transactions means trying to make a transaction confidential. And how does it do it? With one specific idea, that on the blockchain at the moment, as you probably know, well, as we just discussed, um, the, the, the amounts, uh, well, let's say the whole structure of the transaction is put onto the blockchain. Anyone can read it. Yes. Right? You can see the, the big, addresses. The big ledger. The big ledger that has to be public by design. That's the whole idea, right? Yeah. Everyone can go on, you know, whatever your website and they can read all any transaction they want. If I give you an address, you can go and look it up. And you can see yeah. all the transactions, all the inputs, even the dates and the time and the, the amounts of the transactions, like $3 or 50. Well, it's in Bitcoins, one Bitcoin or two Bitcoins, Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Right. So confidential transactions is blind the amounts, hide specifically the amounts not the addresses but the amount so instead of it showing up as uh, address one two three pays uh, one bitcoin it just says address one two three pays blank you can't read it yeah okay. so it's hiding the amounts of the transactions and i'm sure you can see that if you were to create a system like that it would be much uh, better privacy yeah because then you wouldn't be able to track yeah, okay. like we were talking about, like the like what we just talked the about, right? Guy. The um, yeah. the coffee shop and the dry cleaner. Well, you wouldn't yeah. know the difference between the coffee shop and the dry cleaner payment because they yeah. they wouldn't show three dollars and fifty dollars. They just so blank. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. So that's confidential transactions, and it, we don't have that in Bitcoin. Um, but it's um, it's something people have been investigating very actively for maybe I don't know two or three years. Uh, Greg Maxwell came up with the idea, I think, in early twenty fifteen. Might have been earlier. Anyway, so in order to do this, there's there's some tricky stuff involved. It's not easy, and it changes a lot of things. Okay. And this is, it, by the way, if you start like investigating and talking to people about privacy, you'll, you'll see this crops up a lot. That when you try to make privacy tech, sometimes it makes it more inconvenient, but it has other side effects too, or it could have other side effects. Like it could make it, it could make the transactions bigger. 
which is annoying. We don't want big transactions because that makes the blockchain bigger and that's really inconvenient. Yeah, it takes up too much memory. Yeah, think, think of it like this. If I just write down the number two, that doesn't take up much space. But if I take the number two and then add some huge random <laughs> number to it, 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 it somehow, somehow suddenly it's uh, I don't know 32 bytes instead of just one bit. I'm, I'm just making this up, but you get the general idea. Yes. Privacy tech can make things more like weighty, more heavy, more uh, bigger, or maybe it can make it more difficult to compute. So what is bulletproof? Bulletproof is just uh, like an add-on to the internal technical stuff inside um, inside confidential transactions to make it less make it take up less space. And it uses it's something so called, impressive. yeah, it compresses, yeah, it compresses, think of it like this, like this is the size of a Bitcoin transaction today. If you do confidential transactions and you make the amounts private, then it suddenly it's huge, right? But with Bulletproofs, it brings it way down and it's like not as small as original, but it's much, much better. Yes, yeah, so this is more efficient. And, and Bulletproofs are an example of... Um, something called zero knowledge proofs, um, where the idea is to somehow prove something in a really clever way that doesn't reveal any extra data. So it's trying to be like perfectly private, if you like. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, I, I, we, pr we probably went a bit technical in the last uh, <laughs> minute, or, minute or two, right? I, I, but I understood, you kept it general, okay. don't worry, I understood. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> so it just makes things easier to to exactly. achieve that. Keep it private as possible. Exactly. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Um, our final question. Okay. What are you working on or what can we look forward to? Okay. Doing? All right. So, um, well, we were just mentioning Bulletproofs and that was particularly interesting to me. So I've just recently, what I've just finished doing is spending a lot of time compiling like a document to explain it. So some people hopefully will get benefit out of that. What I'm thinking about doing next, um, I'm not sure about this, but we'll see how it goes. But my idea is that what I just described to you about CoinJoin has the problem, which you correctly identified, is that it's a lot of hassle, right? Mm -hmm. You have to arrange to do something with someone else. And we discussed... We can improve that with using a market. That's true. I had, I had another idea recently, a few months ago, maybe um, to make uh, CoinJoin non-interactive or at least nearly non-interactive. So non-interactive, uh, what I mean is interactive is what you identified as being a pain, right? When you send a transaction to your friend in Bitcoin, you don't have to, you have to get the address from them. That's true. Yeah. But you don't have to like, talk to them in real time to make the transaction work. They could be like asleep, right? And you could just do it. Right. So my, my, my thought was there might be a way to make CoinJoin non-interactive in that way. So, but it, it's kind of like semi non-interactive where let's say I'm like a Bitcoin expert with a bunch of um, clever software and I come up with a CoinJoin transaction and I, and I sort of send it somewhere. And then later you choose to pick it up and do it if you want to. Okay. And then from your point of view, as an ordinary user, it's non-interactive. You just see it out there in, on, on the internet and you say, oh, yeah, I'll do that transaction. So and I've called this, uh, this idea Snicker. I've written a blog post about it a few months ago. So I was thinking about maybe trying to implement that. It's a bit... Um... So is it, is, is it possible that when, you, when someone is sending out these transactions that somehow the computer could match up? Um, well, the computers are doing it, all of it on both sides, but it, the, the fundamental, the fundamental prop, the thing that makes it interactive is this, that the scenario I described to you in the coffee shop and the dry cleaning shop, it, what makes it interactive is that there's two people making a payment, right? Yes. And both people have to sign the transaction. I mean, it's, it's really fundamental, right? That, that your security, at, if you've if you've got a Bitcoin wallet, your security is that oh you and only you get to decide whether the transaction goes ahead. Yes, right? you didn't consent that. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's you, but you, but it's because it's you, because it's your coins, right? But if yeah. if two of us are making a payment, both of us have to make a decision to sign it. So there's two separate decisions that have to be made, you know, uh, and so that's what what creates the kind of friction in it, uh, and even more so if you're talking about five or ten people. 
So there, there are different ways to approach it. One, one, I guess maybe I could interpret your question about the computer doing it in, in another way, which is you could imagine there being a central server mm -hmm. and the central server operates to just like the, the, the individual people just interact only with that server. So they, they, right. um, Okay. Matches up, matches up, matches up. Yeah, the server could function, a, a kind of matching function, absolutely. Uh, there there have been several, not several, uh, there have been a couple of uh, proposals to do that kind of thing. One of them was called Tumblebit, which wasn't technically coin join, but it had a very similar property. Um, Tumblebit had that concept of a server, but but it was set up so that the server was not trusted with the money. That's That's the key thing, right? And there's a similar idea that um, Adam, who's with you, has been working on. He's called, well, he's called the whole kind of design zero link. But at the heart of it is the idea of a server where, again, you don't have to trust it with the money, but you have this effect of coordinating the people. Like they, they send their stuff in and then the coin join effectively comes out. Yeah. It's, yeah it's, I, yeah. I think I understood from the Tumblr that sometimes the money is to get lost from the computer. So I guess zero link. Mm, I, certainly it's true that money can't really get lost yeah. with coin join it, it can't with with um whether it's the zero link approach or the join market approach or any other approach with coin join the money can't get lost as long as the code is written correctly and it's quite easy to write the code correctly because you just basically have to check that your money arrives and you don't sign the transaction if the, your money doesn't arrive right so it's got that very nice property that it's got a sort of natural security. Um, Tumblebit, is there a way the money? I mean, Tumblebit is a significantly more complicated protocol, but it, 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 that's kind of a complicated technical question. So I'll I'll put that down. Next time. Next time. Thank you very much for your no time. time. And yeah. guys, tune in next time for our next Cyberpunk 101. Bye. Wallet Wasabi coming soon. I think the most exciting thing right now is the Lightning Network, and that's a way of improving um, improving the scalability of Bitcoin is the main motivation, but it has other good uses, and one of them is that would probably improve the privacy.